per aver accettato questo invito. È un piacere per noi avere ospite questa sera il professor Daniel Klein. Eh, il professor Klein insegna alla George Mason University eh, in Virginia, è eh, una delle colonne portanti del Mercato Center, che è un think tank eh, all'interno dell'università che eh, realizza sia attività divulgativa delle idee liberali, sia attività di policy, di movimento e eh, lavoro sui temi ehm, correnti nel dibattito eh, americano, che è un PhD della New York University, ehm, che ha scritto moltissime cose in passato su temi eh, molto, molto diversi. Uno dei suoi libri che personalmente preferisco è dedicato a Knowledge and Coordination, una questione alla quale più si è applicato, ma ha fatto eh, anche lavori effettivamente molto applicati, per esempio è stato è, eh, responsabile di un progetto per l'Independent Institute of California di eh, monitoraggio e analisi dell'attività dell'FDA americano, la Food and Drug Administration, che è il eh, regolatore eh, farmaceutico, ma non eh, solo farmaceutico. Da alcuni anni eh, Klein è eh, impegnato in una battaglia forse un po' dolcisciottesca, anglosassone, cioè una battaglia per, la, per riappropriarsi eh, della parola liberalism. Come sapete ehm, c'è una situazione molto famosa di Schumpeter, a un certo punto eh, nella storia i nemici dell'impresa privata resero l'estremo tributo di attribuirsi il nome della teoria che la sorreggeva per dire un po' il contrario. Uh, il liberal americano di oggi sono, per citare Giovanni Sattoni, i socialisti di un paese senza uh, socialismo. Uh, Klein invece è convinto che ci sia eh, diciamo così, una, un tessuto uh, particolarmente prezioso uh, nella parola e nella storia della parola uh, liberalismo che non, non deve essere, diciamo così, ceduto Uh, giusto apponendo l'aggettivo classico come si fa da quando i liberi sono diventati per appunto socialisti, imprese senza socialismo e invece uh, si è cominciato a chiamare liberalismo classico sostanzialmente uh, la dottrina uh, del governo uh, militare. Uh, vi è stata distribuita una serie di slide che sono quelle che il professor Klein utilizzerà uh, adesso. Uh, come vedete è una relazione molto, molto ricca che abbraccia anche come dire, la storia di questa uh, dottrina, la storia di questa uh, famiglia, uh, anzi, una, del pensiero politico uh, moderno, e pertanto io smetto di sottrarre il tempo, vi cedo la parola e lo ringrazio moltissimo di essere qui con noi oggi. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I'm very glad to be here in this lovely setting. Uh, and I hear about the history of Bruno Leone from my home in Fairfax, Virginia. But uh, I've been a fan of Alberto for a long time. I know more about Alberto than I do about the Institute. Um, I know about his translation of Rosmini, an important 19th century Italian liberal. I know about Alberto's work at EconLog, where he's part of a great lineup of bloggers and one of the leading uh, econ blogs in the United States, and bringing the European perspective, which I think is very much needed uh, in our American reading. Uh, and I don't know if you mentioned, but he did a great article from my journal, uh, Econ Journal Watch, uh, on classical liberalism in Italy since the unification. It's a great scholarly piece, so I've been a great fan of Dr. Rose, and I'm delighted to be able to meet him in person and so on. Uh, great work. Um, so I don't want to overwhelm you, whelm you, but I think I am going to overwhelm you. <laughs> uh, it's long, and I hope you have a handout so at least you can kind of follow along. It's really quite elaborate. Uh, it's, I do really believe in this. It's something I've been working on a long time. Um, and so there's a lot of stuff in it, what I'm going to say, uh, packed in. Some of it you might not be really acquainted with at all, but now you will be. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see how much time I'm happy to take as much time as you like. Uh, anyhow, liberalism 1.0, the original political liberalism, liberal in the original political sense of the term. Sometimes it's called classical liberalism, and people say, oh, you're just making that up. But I think it's cogent, as I am going to suggest throughout tonight, and that Adam Smith in particular looms large in that for me. I do think that our instincts are rooted in the ancestral band. So this is going all the way back to the upper Paleolithic. I think it's important for political psychology. We, our genes came from small, very small, simple society where we experienced and in some sense have been selected for a very strong social cohesion, which I think is actually very natural to us, and which later in our story found new expression in politics, which I think has misled us. So we're gonna come back to this, but I'm gonna jump ahead a few million years, um, <laughs> or at least a few hundred thousand years. Um, traditional society and the concept of higher things being the things most meaningful to us, and then lower things, more mundane things in our life. And I think in traditional society, you see efforts by the, pop, the government and the church and so on to create that kind of cohesion, social cohesion, uh, like we kind of have in our genes, I think, uh, where lower things are understood to serve higher things, and great deal of uniformity in our sense of what's important, the higher things, and a kind of social system. <clears throat> um, and we, we saw this, uh, I think, for, you know, for hundreds of years, and you can think of the higher things as the more sacred things. And the lower things, again, is the more mundane things. I think this is an important way of talking because a lot of people are asking themselves about what's really important in life. So I'm going to offer a little bit of a narrative. I think the printing press really is important. I know it's a cliche, but I think it's hugely important uh, in bringing forward liberalism 1.0 and really kind of starting the story. It allowed intellectuals and clerics, theologians, to basically sort of innovate and secede from the church, in a sense, compete in the higher things. Um, and they still had the idea that whoever was the ruler should determine the religion, so then becoming the ruler, just like the ring of power, the Lord of the Rings, becomes terribly important. And so, well, gee, people butchered each other in wars of religion for a long, long time. And I think this gave rise uh, to, you know, new intellectuals who started thinking about, gee, maybe we should back off the higher things and actually tolerate other religious views. Maybe some people even may suggest and separate church and state. And then, gee, maybe we should separate the state from higher things quite generally. So there's this movement coming through these centuries in this way, I feel. Meanwhile, this is the time of the rise of the nation state. What should the nation state be doing? I want to read this quote. I'm going to skip many of the others. He said, this is Arthur Mauser, early modern thinkers, for example, Machiavelli, and later thinkers, uh, endeavored to, form, to find a form of politics that could do without such consensus. They deliberately set out to subvert traditional society and to replace it with a fundamentally new kind of social organization. It's the ever precarious attempt to define the truth about life's highest goods. Instead, it would unite men on the promise of preventing the most obvious and basic evils. Thus, by standing traditional society on its head, by openly switching the purpose and moral basis of the state from our highest to our lowest and they attempted to separate politics from the whole disputed sphere of morality and religion. Um, and doing this refocusing on the lower things meant, well gee, what are these lower things? 
How do we assign them? How do we conceptualize them? So there was this undertaking of sort of dividing and subdividing a sense of what these lower things are. I'm saying more about this in a minute. How did it create a lower things operating system on which then people would act on their own more and pursue the high things in life as they saw fit? giving rise eventually in Adam Smith to what he called the liberal plan. Now I think the guys we're talking about saw the dangers of discohesion in this. And those are real dangers. But I think they had a sufficient faith in spontaneous order that still on the whole it was worth going this way, going with it, okay, letting it happen and managing it and coping with it. Now that's not to say that liberalism 1.0 does not monkey at all with higher things in life because in a way it closes off some options. It's sort of saying don't go for a highly cohesionist status higher thing. So it sort of, it sort of precludes certain high things but otherwise sort of says and from there it's up to you. You pursue the high things. We're not here to tell you as liberals what your high things are. We're just saying we really don't want you to do these ones. <laughs> so it does monkey with the high thing space, if you will. So in that sense, it's really not neutral, entirely neutral in the high thing space. But neither is it really a guide or a prescription for what you, know, you should find meaningful. Um, and it does not forsake the high things, as we have often been accused of forsaking. Many people accuse us of forsaking the high things, just because uh, liberals, if you will, um, uh, don't tell you what high things are and should be for you. It doesn't mean that we don't care and pursue high things uh, ourselves, and, and, and that that's actually the ultimate justification for liberal views. Um, and so it's a, a feeling that it's better than the alternatives, it's not a simple maxim, and it's a sense, it's almost an aesthetic sense of what works better for more beautiful society. So these are some of the guys who flow into liberalism 1.0 uh, and are sort of telling the government back off of the higher things. <clears throat> I want to just mention that the idea that Christianity made liberalism possible resonates with me, as Larry Siegenthal argues in this book, perhaps by creating a kind of humankind encompassing ethical backdrop that reduces the problem of um, uh, of um, of discohesion of liberal liberal policy and liberal society. <clears throat> but these guys were Christians or professed to be Christians and certainly were for Christianized audiences. Rodius is a very important Dutch jurisprudence writer um, and he really brought jurisprudence into moral philosophy focusing on one's own, suum. In Latin, one's own. Yeah. This is the lower things we're talking about. The specifying, clarifying, defining lower things. Um, and he's saying, these are going to be your, your own, and it, the idea is to secure it against being messed with. Not only by your neighbor, but also by the state to a good extent. They taught that focal rules emerge in societies regarding suum, lower things, one's own, um, that only outward action is justiciable, that is to say, just intent, you know, just feelings or beliefs or hatreds or even by themselves are should not be matters of justice until action is actually occurring. And the government job's job is basically to safeguard the suum one's own. That's the refocusing of government on lower rather than the higher things. Now, <clears throat> this is a little scheme about the rise of the nation state and the kind of 
move toward a um, governor or superior and the inferior that's governed. And the jurisprudence people were looking forward of promoting this kind of thing, but at the same time highlighting through this jurisprudence they're, they're teaching how special and exceptional that player is. And they really made that exceptional character clear from how only this general superior, the governor, got to make rules and tax people and control people. So they were very clear about that. And so they, they brought this jurisprudence into moral philosophy. And this, I think, is distinctively modern. Adam Smith says this. When I say modern, I mean the last several, cent you know, four or five centuries. I mean modern as opposed to the ancients. So it's a little, so liberalism 1.0 is actually modern in that sense. And so the term classical liberalism is a little bit paradoxical and confusing. Because we're really talking about, well, gee, two, three, four hundred years ago. That's not classical. If you go to the classics department, you know, in the university, that's modern. <laughs> so it's, it's a little. Um, now, I want to add that these fellows were not living in a world of political stability. And that very much should influence the way you understand them and read them. They told this origination story from the state of nature. Uh, leading to political society with ideas of social contract and political consent. I want to suggest that that was a sort of ploy, a rhetorical ploy, because of the lack of stable policy, lack of stable government. Um, and it really served two, two purposes. One, for example, I think at Kufendorf, is very much to kind of teach people, hey, Governments come up through a social contract, actually through your political consent in a way, so you need to put up with this stuff you don't like. So in that way, it's actually kind of using this contract theory to teach people to submit and go, you know, accept what's going on, be patient, be, you know. But the other reason is to say, yeah, governments from contract, and you know what? Those bastards are breaking the contract. So that justifies re rebellion and resistance. You know, these are problems you have in the lack of stable polity. Social contract is being used on both sides, as I see it. <clears throat> now, a lot of the story is focused on Britain. And we do get political stability in Britain at the beginning of the 18th century. Okay? And that, I think, changes the story difference between the next guys and people like Rogues and Locke. Um, but still, I do think there's continuity, again, from the Grotius jurisprudence people straight through our heroes, David Hume and Adam Smith, as reflected in the title of Stephen Buckle's book. I'll put this together in a slide here. So we have sort of the jurisprudence tradition there. You see it? Uh, and political stability then coming in Britain. This is one of the most important pictures, by the way. Hume and Smith are really the same thing. There's plenty of seats down here. Joanna, sit down, take them, please, get comfortable. Uh, no, come on. We want you right here. Right? Um, now, it's Smith who introduces liberal as a political term. So he's the one who infuses the original political meaning. He is liberalism 1.0. So in this way, I'm kind of extending liberal backward in this fashion. You might call these guys proto-liberals. I'm just pointing out that these guys, even up through Hume, never used liberal like Adam Smith started to use it. He was like the innovator in that, along with one of his Scottish fellows, William Robertson. <clears throat> so a little bit about David Hume. Uh, he was remarkable in developing uh, ideas of mutual coordination, like Thomas Schelling talks about, uh, and David K. Lewis, as he talks about convention, it's a related idea. Um, and Schelling talked about focal points 
and how we coordinate with one another. And Hume sort of saw things as focal points all the way down, if you will. Even human identity, he sort of interpreted, and causation, he interpreted in terms of focal points. And he developed this idea of convention, again, very much like him, that was different than consent and contract. It's broader. You know, the idea that we have a convention about calling this a bottle is not a, con a matter of contract. It's a matter of um, convention, but we never agreed to it. We certainly haven't promised to call this a bottle. We just call it a bottle. And he talked about all these conventions. So contract and consent would be a subset. Um, and he said that some conventions like these property, contract, and so on, are natural conventions in the sense that in any society that progresses, they are general rules that are necessary, at least among you and your neighbors. Maybe the government is taxing you too much, but if you and your neighbors aren't even respecting each other's property, your society is going nowhere. So these kinds of conventions in any kind of progressing society are like natural Conventions. This is like I deliberately make this kind of a paradoxical term because usually people will put natural and convention at odds with each other. But no, I think we need to think of natural conventions. And for him, political authority is a set of conventions. It's not a social contract. Okay. And this commutative justice, this sum idea, which I'll elaborate in a second, also a set of conventions. Okay. So for him, political authority, whereas Grotius and Bufendorf and Locke said it was in effect in here, he's saying, no, no, it's in here. He actually attacked the idea that political authority was in consent. <clears throat> uh, and Lord Blackstone talks about this progression, and this picture summarizes just a little bit about this. See, see first, these guys actually, as I said, invoke consent and contract, I think because even property is so unstable that it needs to invoke the authority of consent and contract. And politics, when it's unstable, it needs to invoke the authority of consent and contract. So you find this. Locke is a transitional figure. Property for him is not a matter of social contract. It's sort of natural without any prior agreement. But then political consent, he did teach, was these guys make it all the way to no, no. And these guys represent then the conventionalist understanding of these matters, which I very much am enthusiastic about. I love those two guys. <clears throat> I love him the most. And he talked about commutative justice as the most sacred laws of justice, yourself, your possessions and promises do from others. Like if you lent somebody 10 pounds, they have to repay that. So contract. So it's very like solid person property contract idea. That's this commutative justice. Um, I like to put it in parallels where he says as not messing, it's a virtue, this justice. It's something that you're supposed to perform as a virtue, this commutative justice, not messing with other people's stuff. <clears throat> and this formulation nicely separates these three key ideas that you can then analyze. But clarifying the meaning of those is that idea of clarifying the lower things, the mon mundane things, one's own. What is one's own. Whose is it? What counts as messing with it? All those things are that jurisprudence lower things work, preparing the ground for liberalism. These things do have to be understood within historical context. That doesn't make them entirely dependent on whatever you know is happening in that society. There are still general conventions that Go cover societies like you know the idea that this is my hand, unnatural. Uh, of course, slave societies may have denied it, but those societies generally suffered from that violation of that natural convention. So there's a sense in which this is 
one's stuff, uh, regardless of what other people say. Um, okay. Now, commutative justice is one of the types of justice in Smith, um, and he treated it as uh, very special among the virtues, and it plays a special, many special roles in his work. And one of them is to make this distinction between two different kinds of jural relationships. Jural meaning having to do with law and obligation and punishment. Equal people like you and your neighbor, you and your coworker, even you and your employer is equal equal. Versus superior inferior jural relationships, the governor and the government. And he makes this quite clear. So there's these two different kinds of general relationships in Smith. He, says, he maintains this. He presupposes it. He's not an anarchist. He just accepts that this second one is there, too. There's a sense in which I think the second one is extremely unnatural to human beings, going back to that ancestral band thing. But he has two real relationships in this manner. It's based on commutative justice, of the distinction it's based on. So now a little bit about why commutative justice is special among all the virtues. He talks about all the many virtues in theory of moral summons, and he keeps saying that this one is special because its rules, unlike the rules of all the other virtues, are precise and accurate. This rule about not messing with other people's stuff. He says the actions it treats are ones we are generally not to do. So doing nothing, passiveness, is often sufficient to, to fulfilling commutative justice. After all, you know, if you just sit still in your chair, you manage not to mess with other people's stuff. Right? Um, Feedback on one's performance is only negative, whereas for all the other virtues, it's positive or negative. Um, an observance of the rules is indispensable, otherwise society degenerates. Um, we feel a stricter obligation than the other virtues. Indeed, we feel that compliance with commutative justice may be forced. Even among equals, we may feel that way, like self-defense or protecting your own property. Uh, and the other thing is, this is very important, because it's precise and accurate, you can flip this around. Your virtue, the virtue is not messing with other people's stuff. And flipping it around is others not messing with your stuff. And that he called security in the equal-equal relationships and liberty in the superior-inferior, that is to say, the governor-governed relationships. So you see, liberty is the flip side of this community of justice which comes out of the jurisprudence stuff about the lower things, okay? <clears throat> so, this is communion of justice, distributive justice. Distributive justice is making a becoming use of what is your own, making a beautiful use of what is yours. This is about not messing with other people's stuff. This is about a beautiful use of your own. This is about estimating objects justly and is the vaguest and broadest, he says this. And so this big focus on this thing gives that operating system for people to pursue those things. And that's how he generally feels it should go under liberal policy. In a way, this reflects the phrasing of the, the U.S. Declaration of Independence. The lower things, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We don't guarantee happiness. We don't even specify how you're going to find happiness. But with these, you can pursue the higher things. Pocock, just the beginning of it, says, the child of jurisprudence is liberalism. So that's just a theme, that liberalism actually, the groundwork, in a way, is laid by the jurisprudence stuff, which then gives a language for, like, free market. Like, what do we even mean by that? Leaving people alone, individual liberty. This stuff had to be invented. And it was invented, in a sense, 
by taking the jurisprudence concepts, flipping them around, and now making them a political. The Smith, you see that the spine of liberalism is this community of justice, liberty thing in his work. He teaches a presumption of liberty, like the presumption of innocence. Not that everybody is innocent in the courtroom, but the burden of proof is on the pros prosecution. There's a presumption of innocence. And so the presumption of liberty is that the burden of proof is on the contravener of the liberty principle. Not that government should never intervene or tax people, but that the burden of proof is on such intervention. And, more, and, and the wealth of nations morally authorizes the pursuit of honest income and the presumption of liberty and policy. And you know what happens then? After this guy, this great moral philosopher, writes the wealth of nations, giving moral authorization to these things, we get the blade of the hockey stick. Bang. Deirdre McCloskey's great enrichment. Right? He kind of laid it all out. He morally authorized it and said, go. And they went. And from when he published this book, that's when wealth took off. That's when enrichment took off. <clears throat> so it worked. <laughs> Also, he established, as I said, liberal as the signifier of this new political flaw. Not that it's entirely new, but this increasingly clarified and you know, advancing political philosophy. Now, I've treated the semantic history in other stuff, and I don't want to repeat that here. I don't know if you've ever seen these engrams, but this is about the occurrence of, of phrases in time and Smith used these phrases right around here, right around here rather, again, William Robertson died, started actually in 1769. And they pick up, and people start using liberal in this new way to represent or signify this political philosophy we're talking about. There's different ways to show this. Uh, the, other, the other videos go into a great deal more. It's very solid, I have to say. I really feel very confident about it. Um, and so we have Smith representing kind of like the original arc of liberalism and a kind of liberal era. I'm not saying that it was a comprehensive liberalism by any means, it was far from it. But there was an ascendancy to the ideas, to the culture, and to the way of talking, the way of using words that are at the center of liberal civilization. Um, the, now, he said that the liberal plan is plain and intelligible to common understandings. So is it really a simple formula? I think actually there are a lot of complications. I'm going to throw a list at you. Uh, I'm going to just mention what some of them are. Uh, but the punchline is that I think it still survives. Some of the distinctions that complicate things. Oops seeing the distinction between the equal-equal versus the superior-inferior general relation. You've got to keep that in mind. There's the whole matter of the stable polity versus the not stable polity. In, the, in a stable polity, all bets are off. I mean, liberalism kind of presupposes a stable polity. Uh, there's this distinction between the science of a legislator, as he put it, versus the art of liberal politics. Tough matters to negotiate and navigate. Um, there's these other things having to do with liberty and clarifications about liberty uh, that I won't try to go into here. Um, we've talked about the presumption of liberty, but without question, we have to recognize that Adam Smith also status quo. That's always around us as well, as it should be. And sometimes these two sometimes these two presumptions are shoulder to shoulder together against a new reduction in liberty. But sometimes they are in tension. When people are introduced liberalizations into society, you've got these two ten, these two presumptions in tension, and that's kind of embarrassing for liberals in a way. Um, Liberty versus independency, being more radical and challenging versus more 
marginal or around the branches versus this is more the root and this is more the branches and that kind of way of talking these issues of talking questions of second best in politics you know then you can't get to the first best but i'm talking about the fifth best instead of in the 17th best which is where we're at perhaps and then there's exoteric versus esoteric discourse esoteric meaning that there's sort of hidden and double meanings so all of these things are important, but I think liberalism 1.0 survives all these complications that you might recognize as out there. Um, and it does suggest a big tent of liberalism 1.0 with a general posture against governmentalizing social affairs. Not as much taxes, not as much active government control, not such big government players in society. I think it's not destinational about the ideal liberal world. I don't know what that is or should look like. Don't ask me. But we do have a very clear sense of the direction. So it's directional from the status quo. Do you think that British experience is central in this? Uh, it's, it's just the way it is, I think. I mean, we could say more about that, but I just want to acknowledge it. That's not to say that other countries don't have their great liberal traditions. Like Italy does, like many countries do, they had a great liberal. I don't know why the slide keeps advancing, but um, uh, so, but, but I do think that, that the British experience is central. Now, moving on to the more recent part of the story, it declined, and some say it was because it failed. I think there are other explanations, but we'll have to move on. And we see in all sorts of evidence a change in mentality, uh, in particular a mentality of governmentalization. These words in English, social justice, equal opportunity, economic equality, equality of opportunity, democratic ideals, fundamental rights. It's amazing, but none of these existed before, or they existed before 1890. And I think they tell us a lot about how thinking and talking changed. And of course, the governmental institutions themselves exploded. Um, most importantly, the important words of liberal civilization lost or changed meaning. This whole liberalism, one thing, kind of collapsed among the intellectuals, the young, up and coming people in particular, which meant going forward into the 20th century. Liberalism 1.0 wasn't the way of the future. Um, at this website, Brian Daza and I provide a compendia of quotations about these 10 terms showing people in this post-1880 era using it in this new way. And then another compendium of people, particularly old liberals, saying, hey, you're using that word in a new way, and not the right way. So there was a very much a change in, in semantics, in language at the time. One picture that shows this really quite clearly, and the timing is perfect, this is 1880, 1890, is that people had to start saying new liberalism, and other people said old liberalism. So you can see how people had to resort to that, because liberalism changed its meaning. The Liberal Party in Britain changed its character. It wasn't Gladstone anymore. You can think of three phases of liberalism. Uh, liberalism 1.0, that we've been describing. Democratism, the advancement of direct involvement by citizens in political decision making and so on. And then this later uh, liberal identity, uh, which I think is pretty much the governmentalization of social affairs. Now, the left often say, oh, we're actually compatible with this. It's just the times have changed, and those old policies about free markets and controlling the government, limiting the state, those don't fit our times anymore. The world has changed, and now the ideals and the goals for society are still the same, but in the new world, we need more government activity to serve those goals. 
So we're really true to the old liberalism. It's just that different times call for different measures. And now the measures need to be more government involvement, government supervision. I don't really buy that. I see this more as a tension. I want to elaborate a little bit on that. I think that the left does play upon and expresses this sort of ancestral band purge in humankind, and it's finding an outlet and expression in politics. I think this is Hayek's thesis about modern politics, especially aimed at the left. Uh, the idea of an atavism thesis, atavism meaning the emerge, re emergence of something ancient which is no longer appropriate, which is no longer fitting and suitable. And they've got the, I think, the ancestral band cohesionism coming out in their politics, um, and it doesn't suit the modern world. And Hayek talked about it in these things. In a very broad sense, this makes the left reactionary, if there's any truth to what I'm saying. Because in the ancestral band, you sort of have the people and a very strong cohesionism or cohesion. And then in this modern liberal era, you had the sort of governor over the, the uh, citizens, the inferiors, and then in a liberal setting, each pursuing uh, their own happiness, kind of leading to this cohesion, because your happiness may not be my happiness. We might live right next to each other and might you know, be interested in the same things. And I think the yearning, again, on the left, is kind of to recapture this. So in that sense, the left is reactionary. Right? They always get the credit for being so modern and progressive, and their enemies are the reactionaries. But in a way, their reaction to liberalism 1.0. Just some points now about this tension. Liberalism 1.0 has this presumption of liberty. Left doesn't have that. They almost they have they almost have the opposite presumption, it seems to me. Liberalism 1.0, opposition to bigger government, more governmentalization of social affairs. The left often seems to relish governmentalization. Small government versus big government. Simple rules versus what turn out to be, in fact, complicated, huge bureaucracies and rules. Um, the liberalism 1.0 is the idea of keeping the government out of the higher things, whereas I think left, whether they say it or not, uh, is quite the opposite. Um, liberalism 1.0 isn't about policing inner thoughts, whereas we see on the left all sorts of animosity about what you might be thinking and how you might have hated somebody and hate crimes and hate speech and discrimination and all of this things about your sentiments and your beliefs and your thoughts that they uh, are ready to come down on you for. Um, we saw in liberalism 1.0 that we're talking about the Sumon and subdividing ownership so that it's Alberto's own and Dan's own and each person's own. But here you see a kind of presumption of a kind of collectivity of ownership in the polity, like say Italy. Um, and a little language that fits that. I don't think it was for nothing that Hayek called his appeal to democratic socialists the road to serfdom. Okay, because it's kind of like a new collective ownership of the polity. Um, and the liberalism sees the government as coercive, going back to the whole business about the general dualism, whereas I think the left likes to see government as voluntary. Like, these are the rules of Club Italy. You voluntarily agree to those rules by living here. If you don't like them, leave. It's voluntary. Whereas the Smithian approach, no, still sees the taxes and interventions as coercive. A little bit more about this. These guys believe in the holiness of the whole, the greater good, but it's very indeterminate in their thinking about what that is, whereas I think the left tend more towards a sense of a determinate or imminent whole. These guys are very clear that there's no final validator of what's proper meaning and higher things. And here again, I think they're looking for a final validator. 
Disjointed knowledge, a big Hayekian theme. Common knowledge, a common theme. Many open society sympathies for you to make your life. These people look for a kind of collective romance. Society as spontaneous order, society as an organization. There's no literal vast cooperation. Here there's, I think, a yearning for a vast cooperation. Emphasis on the community of justice we talked about, we talked about, and here we see talk of something called social justice. So I think there is a real um, tension between them. And in a way, I think the left it kind of represents a faction. And it's a faction that has great cultural power in the United States and in Italy, in academia and the press and the arts and Hollywood and a lot of places, um, and in government by and large. Um, uh, but uh, I do think it's kind of a, a faction, which a number of people are, a number of types of people, social conservatives, nationalists, they're kind of unhappy about this. Classical liberals, liberalism 1.0 people like me, are unhappy about this left faction. And I think in the last US election, a lot of these people realize that like, we're unhappy about the left faction, and we're going to vote Republican. They're more diverse than the Democrats, because there's all these different types who are unhappy about the left faction. Um, liberalism, we're talking to each other here in America, I'm talking to you guys, and so we're talking more to each other across the world, and communication enables us to do that. You guys maybe use the word liberalism like Adam Smith used it. Is that fair to say? It's kind of, it's in between perhaps. Um, I just want to say that these technologies that we have enable not only us to talk across the Atlantic Ocean, they also allow us to talk, as it were, or at least to listen, back in time. And that the availability of these texts, the ability to listen to podcasts about these guys, search their texts, study their texts, communicate with others about their texts, actually in a way is a benefit of technology too. And we look for moral authority in life. Uh, and I think we have greater prospects of actually talking more about this as we search our souls about what it means to be liberal. The conclusions, uh, liberalism 1.0 is I think the spine of the modern open society. It leads against governmentalization. It upholds the presumption of liberty. It's paramount figures out of Smith. I do think those Smiths and Hume totally recognize complications and compromises. Uh, and I think it's basically at odds with leftism. This is a shot from the end of Roman Holiday, if you ever saw that movie. And it's just to remind you that um, liberalism is not you. The, the, the higher things in life are your responsibility. Um, liberalism is not a, 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 a philosophy of life. It's not a guide of uh, how to make meaning in your life and how to find happiness. Um, it's a political philosophy. Um, again, I do think it monkeys some with the higher things face by saying, no, you shouldn't go here. But it's not, it's not an answer to life's questions, so let's not ever uh, pretend that it, that it is. So I'm very interested in your reactions, and I, I hope we have enough time. <laughs> Thank you.